When we um, were beginning this program, I, as um, Albert told you, I was inspired by Dr. Mayer at Moss Rehab Hospital. And he was the one who actually embarrassed me because I didn't know about these fields uh, and encouraged me to, uh, to learn more. So that was why I went to Rancho Los Amigos Medical Center uh, in Downey, California, which is in Los Angeles County, to work with Dr. Jacqueline Perry, who was truly the icebreaker. Breaking glass ceilings, in some part, has to do with just being old enough to, uh, <laughs> to have them that low. Uh, but anyway, I, I spent a lot of time with Dr. Perry and her colleagues, and then returned to Philadelphia, specifically to work with uh, Dr. Ashkenazi and Dr. Mayer at Moss Rehab, but also my family was there, so it was nice to be back with family. So when we, when we met, we had to gradually work uh, our way into how we would build this into a program, and so Dr. Mayer, Albert, and I began to meet and to see patients together. So, so, um, you got yeah, I think I, uh, so what we, we started doing was trying to figure out a way to do this in a collaborative manner. Um, we decided that we would have um, evaluations that were done in a combined manner. Uh, that was kind of unusual uh, because of the payment system in the U.S. Uh, having a combined uh, session meant that we would only get one payment and not the usual two payments that people would get. Uh, but we decided that that was not important, that we should do it like that. Um, and we decided at that point that it would make sense to also bring other people that were dealing with the patient. So we brought therapists, we brought orthotists, um, and uh, others who were involved, sometimes the family members. Um, and this were very uh, very difficult evaluations, evaluations that not only took time, um, but that took a lot of uh, really heavy thinking and heavy discussion. I remember that when I would finish doing the clinics, uh, the neuroorthopedic clinics, I would go uh, home and say, clinics, boy, I would go crazy. home and say, boy, this was a tiring day. Uh, and it was just, um, so we, we decided that it made sense to start working in this collaborative manner, that the information that we could see from each other and glean from each other and uh, uh, the opinions of each other started to say, uh, you know, gee, I didn't think about that. Uh, maybe we need to uh, act on that. And uh, it took time. You know, you, you need to learn to trust each other to be sure that what you're doing um, is uh, really fitting to the patient and get away from the idea that I am the orthopedic surgeon or I am the neuro rehabilitator or I'm either uh, the physician who does uh, rehabilitation, but really to become, um, we are the physicians of this individual and we can work together and collaboratively to do that. And a big part of it, as Albert was saying, is we needed to educate each other because at least I only had fairly superficial understanding of what physical medicine and rehabilitation could add, uh, and even the sophistication of the, of the therapist, and began to think of approaching these problems um, as tools, and which, which tools in the treatment were most appropriate for not only one patient for each, but also for each individual deformity. So it was always a combination, perhaps doing uh, chemo denervation first, who needed uh, laboratory analysis, and then doing surgery, so it had to be combined, and many times it was uh, Albert who gave me ideas for surgery. Sometimes it was a very complex patient, and then he would say, what do you want to do with this? Or how do you treat this surgically? And other times he actually made suggestions <clears throat> that led to uh, new surgical techniques. And as he said, we're always going back and forth. I said, no, you know, I think you would have just you know, do some chemo denervation therapy. He said, no, 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 I think you should do surgery. And that really was an indication of how difficult the patient was. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so we essentially uh, decided that there would be a, a minimum set in the team. Um, we decided that, that uh, those members needed to have certain skills and um, that we would approach each of them in a, in a manner that uh, made sense. So you couldn't have we knew the limitations, for example, of having a neurosurgeon full-time working with us, but that there would be cases in which we would invite a neurosurgeon and help us, even if it was for a, a pump implantation or maybe for a neurectomy, if uh, Marianne and her team felt that uh, that couldn't be done by them. Uh, and so, uh, really, it, you know, we brought therapists that thought in a specific way that, that could 
have this idea of accepting the opinion of various individuals. At the same time, to really uh, evolve the structure and grow it in a manner that uh, would respond to the needs of the patients that we were saying, uh, seeing. And then um, really adjusting the environment. Uh, when Marianne moved out of the, uh, uh, the uh, Moss Rehab and Einstein structure to a different institution, we had to come around with a way on how to continue our meetings and our exchanges and how to bring patients to uh, discussions. And we had lovely dinners. You know, we came up with the idea that we would have uh, a dinner every couple of weeks. And uh, uh, we decided that we would sponsor them in different ways or we would pay out of pocket. But it would create an excuse for the team to continue to work together. Um, and so uh, it really evolved in response to that growth. And also we began work with uh, Dr. Mayer in upper extremity uh, surgery because in, in many ways they're more complex since you have more variety and choices, um, degrees of freedom in mo uh, movement. And um, so in general we would treat the lower extremity deformities first and make sure we had good leg to stand on uh, and then begin to introduce some of the uh, upper extremity procedures. So let me... Uh, try to illustrate how we work together through a very short case presentation. So this is uh, a 51-year-old woman with a history of uh, right hemiparesis secondary to a stroke. She had uh, three years prior to our initial evaluation. She complained of right foot pain, a sense of instability that started a few months after her stroke. And uh, the pain and discomfort was primarily in the ankle, and the forefoot, and the tips of her toes. And she reported her pain as being very severe in the 7 to 10 range, uh, which was worsened by walking or weight bearing. And uh, she was able to walk in the community, but she used uh, a cane to do that. Um, in her exam, I'll just point uh, essentially that she had a, a fairly substantial equinus attitude of her foot um, and had some weakness throughout the right lower limb. Um, she definitely had limitations in motion with a high ashward um, and a tardu of uh, negative 10 degrees. And this is her walking. So uh, as you can see from here, she was walking pretty slow at 0 0.49 meters per second and in an asymmetrical manner. And uh, for those of you that love gait graphs, uh, here shows clearly that she has an equinus and a slight varus. She has a stiff knee. And uh, we recorded a bunch of her muscles to show that uh, she had a variety of uh, neurological um, uh, lack of control. So after we evaluated her, we uh, concluded that she had a right ankle that was um, in equinus with some toe curling, slight inversion. Um, with overactivity of the long toe flexors, the EHL, gastrocnemius. Uh, she had significant pain primarily in the metatarsal area that further interfered with walking. And uh, she had a right stiff knee gait uh, with involvement of rectus, femoris, gluteus maximus, and hamstrings. And she had pretty profound weakness of her ankle plantar flexors. One of the things I think with uh gait analysis and uh, multi-channel dynamic EMG is it allows us to take a very focused um, <clears throat> approach to a patient so that we're not lengthening or transferring a muscle inappropriately because although we have increased tone, we also have weakness in these muscles. So we need to be very careful about um, preserving that. So our treatment uh, <clears throat> options for her equinus was to do lengthening of the gastrocnemius and soleus. There are two different, different techniques uh, that I've used. One is within the tendon itself, and this is when it's a very rigid deformity. And that decision is also often made at the time of surgery when a patient is asleep, relaxed, and then you can differentiate static deformity from a dynamic deformity. If the foot can be corrected under anesthesia to a neutral position, then instead of lengthening within the Achilles tendon, will do a strayer, um, more proximal lengthening of the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles. And this is pre preferred because it not only saves strength, but it also retains the elastic push off of the, uh, uh, that the Achilles uh, provides at the end of, uh, of stance. 
Because of the calf weakness also, we were already releasing the long toe flexors. So taking an idea from polio is why waste these muscles? And we uh, began transferring them to the uh, oscalsis to regain some of that strength. Initially, I transferred both the flexor digitorum longus and uh, the brevis. But this often resulted in recurrence of the equinus. So ultimately, we only transferred the um, um, the long toe flexor, the FDL. Uh, yeah, go ahead. In, in addition to that, uh, you know, we, we've looked at this and we've published on this uh, over time. We know that as we transfer this long toe flexors uh, to the oscalsis by increasing the strength, uh, uh, many more patients have become ambulators without the need of a brace. The other uh, common procedure is to do a split transfer of the uh, tibialis anterior. This was originally done to split the tendon because if you had the tendon just in the center of the foot, if it was a little too medial, a little too lateral, you would have a new deformity. And Dr. Jacqueline Perry had, uh, <clears throat> in her wisdom, told me that you need to make a surgical procedure foolproof and that any surgeon with reasonable skills <clears throat> could not only do the procedure but have good predictable outcomes. So that was the origin of splitting the tendon so that you would uh, have equal pull on each side of the foot. And as that patient told you, I have 14 or 13 incisions. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them were only one centimeter in length, but you counted them all. <clears throat> so uh, we've uh, looked at this and look at the impact of gait analysis. You know, there, there was usually a, a discussion, um, is gait analysis make a difference in your, that's not us, okay. Uh, is gait analysis making um, uh, a difference in, in, your, uh, in your surgical uh, planning? And so what we did is we actually managed to look at this in a, a methodical uh, uh, manner by uh, having the surgeons, Dr. Keenan and Dr. Fuller, um, spend time evaluating patients. And we evaluated 36 subjects uh, where they uh, looked at the patients, created a uh, surgical plan, and then asked them to write it down. And then we brought back those patients uh, a few weeks later. I always joke with Dr. Keenan that, you know, surgeons have short-lasted memory, so they couldn't remember what the patient was. Um, and then they would bring the patient back, but now with gait analysis, and we're asked to rewrite um, the surgical plan without the benefit of having it, uh, the previous one. And what we saw is a, a big change. Actually, we found that uh, uh, our decision-making changed for the specifics of the plan 64% of the time. And, um, and there wasn't any difference between Dr. Fuller, who's much younger, and myself. So unlike wine, it did not improve. Your decision-making did not improve with, with age. And, but we came closer to our decisions. And the reason why we forgot everything was that we did our uh, evaluations independently of one another. But we wrote down for every specific possible muscle what, uh, what we would do. Nothing, lengthen, release, transfer. And those were our decision points. So the, the other uh, process was the idea of actually taking, um, in this particular patient, the rectus uh, muscle and moving it uh, to the gracilis to facilitate uh, flexion of the knee and continue to serve as a hip flexor. And so uh, Dr. Keenan uh, proceeded to do the surgical procedures on many patients. The uh, technique was actually described first as rectus to sartorius. But I didn't find this to be that useful because you're trying to sew a muscle to a muscle which was not very stable. Um, <clears throat> and patients found it more painful because you're wrapping the rectus muscle around the sartorius. And you didn't get the same leverage. So I began transferring it to the gracilis tendon so that we could release the gracilis. I'm gonna have two longer ends of the tendon to, uh, to meet each other and then not be creating a flexion uh, deformity of the knee. It was a little bit more surgery, uh, but it has worked very well. Now tomorrow, uh, Dr. Zerbinati will be presenting his technique for treating stiff knee gait, which is different, but, uh, but very effective. So in the end, uh, 
Here you see uh, some of the data. Uh, this is the patient before. She was walking at 0.49 meters per second. And after all these surgical procedures and rehabilitation, she ended up walking at 0.64 meters per second. And you see clearly an improvement in the foot structure and uh, the symmetry of her walking. And uh, here she is after, and you can see the graphs for those of you again that follow uh, graphs, an improvement in the equinus attitude of the foot and a significant improvement in the stiff knee gait pattern uh, of this patient. And uh, just so that you see the end result, this is who she uh, ended up being able to flex her knee nicely, being able to get her foot um, in a much better position and certainly um, getting rid of the discomfort and complaints of pain uh, that she had. Uh, this made her really much more functional. She could now cross the street without worrying that a, a car was going to hit her and uh, allowing her to be uh, much more uh, mobile in the community. So many thanks. If you have questions, uh, we've left a few minutes for that. And, uh, uh, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Albert. <laughs>